Hi, my name is Jade and I'm a junior doctor in the Seven Deanery. In this video, we will cover the top five most common urological emergencies that you may see on your urology rotations as a junior doctor and in your medical school finals. We will cover renal tract calculi, testicular torsion, acute urinary retention, priapism and paraphimosis. Let's begin. Calculi in the renal tract are a common urological presentation to ED and can be classed as a urological emergency when they result in sepsis, hydronephrosis and severe acute kidney injury. According to NICE, the annual incidence is 1 to 2 cases per 1,000 people and recurrence rates are high. There are different types of renal tract calculi depending on the elements and minerals they are made from. The most common type of stone is made of calcium oxalate. Stones can also be made of calcium phosphate or mixed calcium oxalate and phosphate. Urate stones are less common but occur in people with gout or children with inborn metabolic disorders. Urate stones are radiolucent. Less common types of stones are cysteine and xanthine stones. A staghorn calculus is a stone in the renal pelvis which extends into at least two calluses and it is made up of struvite which is a combination of magnesium, ammonium and phosphate. Patients present with severe 10 out of 10 colicky pain which can be described as loin to groin pain. It may be associated with visible or non-visible hematuria. On examination, patients will appear in pain. They may appear sweaty and pale. On abdominal examination, you may be able to palpate the kidney, which could indicate obstructive uropathy causing hydronephrosis. Patients may appear clinically dry due to nausea and vomiting. OBS may be normal, or patients may be pyrexial, tachycardic, and hypotensive, which should make you consider urinary tract sepsis. Investigations you would want to do include a urine dipstick initially, then MSU if indicated. You must consider doing blood tests, like renal function tests, as well as a venous blood gas and blood cultures if OBS indicates sepsis. The best imaging for urinary tract calculi is a CTKUB without contrast to help you visualize the stone, its size, and its location within the urinary tract. An ultrasound KUB is an alternative option for pregnant women, children, and young people. While awaiting the CTKUB, adequate analgesia, antiemetics if needed, and rehydration are all essential. NSAIDs are most effective for pain relief in ureteric colic. The most effective analgesia for ureteric colic is PR diclofenac. If NSAIDs are contraindicated or ineffective, IV paracetamol should be offered. If patients are septic, then they must be managed using the sepsis 6 protocol with strict fluid monitoring, IV antibiotics following cultures, and IV fluids. Definitive management options depend on the size of the stone and the presence of any complications. Stones less than 5 mm in size will pass on their own and do not require intervention, just adequate analgesia in the interim. If patients go home with oral NSAIDs, they may also need PPI cover. Stones less than 10 mm in size that are located in the distal ureter can be managed by prescribing an alpha blocker to encourage spontaneous passage of the stone. Stones that are 2 cm and less will usually be managed with shockwave lithotripsy. However, in pregnant females, ureteroscopy is safer. Shockwave lithotripsy is when external shockwaves are generated to fragment the stones under anaesthetic. The smaller pieces of stone are then able to pass through the urinary tract on their own. Ureteroscopy is when a very small flexible camera is passed through the urethra, bladder and affected ureter to go and break the stone into smaller fragments using different energy sources and then retrieve the fragments under anaesthetic. After ureteroscopy or lithotripsy, often a ureteric stent is left in situ for a few weeks. This is a long, soft, hollow, flexible tube. This is because following the procedures, swelling is expected due to the ureteric trauma 
and this can result in worsening of the obstruction and the fragments not being able to pass through. Large complex renal calculi and staghorn calculi are managed with percutaneous nephrolithotomy, which is when a passageway between the external skin and the urinary collecting system is formed, and then the stone is broken up from the inside and fragments removed using the nephroscope. NICE recommends metabolic investigations for people with renal or ureteric stones, including stone analysis, blood calcium levels, and for paediatric patients, considering a referral to a paediatric nephrologist or urologist. Calcium stones can be prevented by ensuring patients increase their fluid intake to 2.5 to 3 litres of water a day for adults, have diets low in salt, carbonated drinks and animal protein, and even by taking potassium citrate or thiazide diuretics. Adding fresh lemon juice to drinks can also help. Oxalate stones can be prevented by taking cholestyramine or pyridoxine as they reduce the amount of oxalate secreted in the urine. Uric acid stones can be prevented by taking allopurinol or alkalizing the urine by taking oral bicarbonate. Allopurinol is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor which reduces uric acid production from purines. Testicular torsion is the top urological emergency that can result in ischemia and necrosis of the testicle if not spotted and managed within six hours. It is caused by the spermatic cord twisting and being unable to untwist. Testicular torsion usually affects young men between 10 to 30 years of age. A risk factor for developing testicular torsion is having long spermatic cords, which is known as bell clapper testes. Patients present with sudden onset of severe unilateral testicular pain, which may radiate to the groin and or the abdomen. It may also be associated with nausea, vomiting and even fainting episodes. The scrotum is swollen, exquisitely tender to touch and patients may be unable to walk. If any young male presents with sudden onset severe lower abdominal pain, especially with nausea and vomiting or fainting episodes, then you must examine the testicles. Can you think of some differential diagnoses for scrotal pain? Some differential diagnoses for unilateral testicular pain include testicular cancer, squamous cell carcinoma of the scrotum, an indirect inguinal hernia, epididymoorchitis, hematocele, hydrocele or varicocele, epididymal cyst or spermatocele, a torted appendage of morgagni, and appendicitis. On examination of the scrotum and inguinal region, patients will have an erythematous or dark-coloured, swollen, elevated or transverse unilateral testis. It will be extremely tender to palpate. There should not be any lymphadenopathy. Lymphadenopathy with a hard asymmetrical testicle should raise your suspicions for testicular cancer. Cough impulse is negative in testicular torsion, but positive if there is a reducible inguinal hernia. Transillumination of the testis can be considered. Hydrocele's transilluminate and hematocele's may transilluminate but to a lesser extent. A blue dot sign is where an inflamed and ischemic twisted appendage can be seen through the scrotal skin. In testicular torsion, the chromatosteric reflex is absent and Prenn's sign is negative. What is the difference between chromosteric reflex and the Prenn's sign? Chromosteric reflex is when, on touching the medial thigh, the ipsilateral testicle elevates. Prenn sign is when pain is reduced by elevating the testicle and if this is positive then this is indicative of epididymitis although it does not completely rule out testicular torsion. Investigations waste valuable time therefore the only investigation necessary is bloods including a clotting screen pre-op. Management is by emergency operation for scrotal exploration which is diagnostic and curative. Intraoperatively, the testis will be distorted and both sides will be fixed to prevent recurrence. Orchidectomy may be performed if the testis is already necrosed. Patients with unilateral orchidectomy are still able to reproduce, although they may be subfertile.
Acute urinary retention is a very common urological emergency occurring in both urological and non-urological patients. It can lead to significant pain and infection. The most common causes are infection, constipation, delirium, a failed TWOC, post-op, BPH, which is a non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate, prostate cancer, medications like anticholinergics, opioids and benzodiazepines, and neurological conditions. Patients present with inability to pass urine, severe suprapubic pain and swelling, and may have infective symptoms like urinary frequency, dysuria, urinary incontinence, and acute confusion. They may have symptoms pointing towards the cause, such as a longer history of interrupted urinary flow, incomplete bladder emptying, nocturia, and constipation. It is very important to remember that patients may be able to pass small amounts of urine but still be in acute urinary retention. This is called overflow incontinence. On examination, patients may have a palpable bladder and abdominal pain suprapubically. They may have a smooth enlarged prostate, hard stools in the rectum or a hard craggy prostate on DRE. They may have signs of infection like crackles on auscultation of the chest or a skin rash. Women may have evidence of prolapse of the bladder on vaginal examination, which could indicate the cause being a cystocele. The most important initial investigations are a bladder scan, a urine dip and MSU or CSU, and a set of bloods to look at the renal function and assess whether there is an element of AKI, and the inflammatory markers to see if the cause could be an infection or there may be a secondary infection. Management and prevention of recurrence involves treating the cause, like infection, constipation, or prostate cancer. In the acute setting, it involves catheterization if there is more than 400 mils of urine in the bladder post-void or the patient is symptomatic. Strict fluid balance monitoring should be done to monitor renal function and to spot and treat post-obstructive diuresis early on. Depending on the cause of the retention, a TWOC might be done in the acute setting or in a specialist TWOC clinic in a few weeks' time. Patients and or their carers will need education on how to maintain their catheters in the interim. The erectile tissues are affected in priapism. Erectile tissues usually fill with blood during sexual arousal, producing an erection. In the root, these tissues are known as the left and right crura and the bulb of the penis. The crura and the bulb continue into the body of the penis. The crura form the two corpora cavernosa, while the bulb forms the corpus spongiosum. The male urethra runs through the middle of the corpus spongiosum. The corpus spongiosum forms the glans penis as you can see in the image. The penis receives arterial supply from branches of the internal pudendal artery, which arises from the internal iliac artery. Venous blood from the cavernous spaces are drained by the deep dorsal vein of the penis, while the superficial dorsal veins drain the superficial parts of the penis, including the skin. Priapism is an uncommon medical emergency that is defined as a painful penile erection lasting more than four hours, which is not associated with sexual stimulation. It can be characterized as either ischemic or non-ischemic. Ischemic priapism is due to reduced venous outflow from the penis, leading to venous congestion in the corpus cavernosa. It is a medical emergency as it can lead to long-term erectile dysfunction. Non-ischemic priapism is due to a very high inflow of arterial blood to the penis, usually due to trauma or congenital abnormalities. The first-line investigation for priapism is cavernosal blood gas analysis to help differentiate between ischemic and non-ischemic priapism. The colour of the blood helps to differentiate the two, Purplish black indicates ischemic and bright red indicates non-ischemic. If patients do not tolerate a cavernosal blood gas analysis, then a Doppler or duplex ultrasound can be done to look at the blood flow within the penis instead. Ischemic priapism is treated with aspiration of blood from the corpus cavernosa and flushing with saline to remove the thick clotted blood. Second line treatment is intracavernosal injection with phenylephrin or other vasoconstrictive agents. Non-ischemic priapism can be managed conservatively at the first instance.
Do you remember the difference between paraphimosis and phimosis? Phimosis is when it is impossible to retract the foreskin over the gland's penis due to inflammation and contraction of the foreskin following infection, or it can be due to a congenital abnormality. This can lead to recurrent balanitis and UTIs, development of fibrotic tissue and closure of the opening to the foreskin, and even can predispose to penile carcinoma. At birth, it is normal for there to be adhesions between the foreskin and the gland's penis, and these gradually break down. Because of this, the British Association of Pediatric Urologists states that treatment should only be considered if the child is over two years of age and has recurrent balanitis or UTIs. Paraphimosis is when the foreskin cannot be pulled back over the gland's penis, causing restriction of blood flow to the gland's penis. This causes worsening edema and necrosis. It is extremely painful. So the difference between phimosis and paraphimosis is that in phimosis the foreskin cannot be retracted and in paraphimosis the foreskin is retracted but cannot be replaced. They are both clinical diagnoses. Management of phimosis is circumcision. Hypospadias must be excluded before a circumcision is performed as the foreskin may need to be used in surgical repair. Hypospadias is a congenital malformation where the urethral opening is located at a site other than the tip of the gland's penis. Usually, it's found on the ventral surface of the penis. Paraphimosis is managed with manual reduction using lots and lots of analgesia, including a local block without adrenaline. If manual reduction fails, then either a dorsal slit or emergency circumcision may be required. Thanks for watching! 